and welcome to the first video for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to get you to think about something that seems obvious, but really isn't. You might have seen chemistry demos involving liquid nitrogen. That's nitrogen gas that has been cooled to such a low temperature that it liquefies. There's lots of neat things we can do with liquid nitrogen, like making flowers and fruit so cold that they shatter. Liquid nitrogen also has a lot of practical uses. We can use it to cool down some materials so that they become superconductors, which are used in things like maglev trains, which can hover above the train rails and move at record speeds along the track. The reason I want you to think about liquid nitrogen is this. In order to become a liquid, molecules have to attract one another so that they stick together and don't escape to become a gas. But why would nitrogen molecules attract each other? If you think of the Lewis dot structure of nitrogen, you can see that each nitrogen atom has an electron pair on it. It seems like the electron pairs should make nitrogen molecules repel each other, not attract. So how can we ever have liquid nitrogen? The answer involves some of the concepts we talked about in class last time. As we saw then, molecules can have several different forces that attract them to each other. The ones that I want to talk about today are called intermolecular forces. To recap, the intermolecular forces are ion-dipole forces, dipole-dipole forces, and London dispersion. Today, we'll look at each of those, and we'll see that they're responsible for lots of the behaviors of liquids and gases. The first of the intermolecular forces we'll look at are ion-dipole forces. Ion-dipole forces are exactly what they sound like. They're attractive forces between ions and dipoles. You might remember from class that dipoles are molecules that have an asymmetric distribution of charge. In other words, one side of the molecule will be more positively charged, and the other side will be more negative. It's easy to see why an ion and a dipole would be attracted to each other. For example, suppose we had a magnesium ion, which has a plus two charge, and some ammonia molecules. If you remember what we learned about molecular geometry back in General Chem 1, you'll know that ammonia is a trigonal pyramidal molecule, which makes it asymmetric. If you've forgotten about molecular geometry, you might want to review videos 32 and 33 of General Chem 1, where we talked about that. Anyway, because ammonia is an asymmetric molecule, it's a dipole, so it has a negative side and a positive side. The negative side is this end of the molecule, since the nitrogen is more electronegative. Because it has a negative charge, it gets attracted to the positively charged magnesium. If the magnesium is placed in a group of ammonia molecules, the ammonias will orient so that their nitrogens are pointing toward the magnesium ion. This is an example of an ion-dipole force, which is one type of intermolecular force. The same is true if we have a negatively charged ion like bromide. In this case, the positively charged side of the ammonia molecules will be attracted to the ion. The next type of intermolecular force is the dipole-dipole force. Again, the name tells you exactly how the force works. It's the attraction between two molecules that are dipoles. So, for example, if we have two ammonia molecules, the negatively charged side of one will be attracted to the positively charged side of the other one. And that's a dipole-dipole force. Dipole-dipole forces can also occur between molecules of two different compounds. For example, here's a chloromethane molecule. It's asymmetric, so it's a dipole. The negatively charged side is where the chlorine is, so this side of the molecule is attracted to the positively charged end of an ammonia molecule. The other end of chloromethane will be attracted to the negative side of an ammonia molecule. So, our first two intermolecular forces are ion-dipole forces and dipole-dipole forces. Ion-dipole forces are always stronger than dipole-dipole forces, but even though the dipole-dipole force is weaker, it's still strong enough to be very important for the properties of many substances, including biologically important ones like proteins and DNA. In fact, the forces that attract the two strands of DNA to each other and that cause proteins to curl into their particular shapes are a kind of dipole-dipole force called a hydrogen bond. A hydrogen bond is an especially strong example of a dipole-dipole force. In order to have a hydrogen bond, one of the two molecules must have a hydrogen atom bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen. 
Because nitrogen and oxygen are especially electronegative, they attract electrons away from the hydrogen, which makes the hydrogen a very strongly positively charged one. The second molecule in the hydrogen bond must have an unshared electron pair in it. The electron pair has a very strong negative charge. So the attraction between it and the positive charge in the hydrogen in the other molecule is very powerful. Because this type of dipole-dipole force is so strong, it gets its own name, the hydrogen bond. One common molecule that experiences hydrogen bonds is water. Remember, in a hydrogen bond, we need two things. On one molecule, we need a hydrogen atom bonded to an oxygen or a nitrogen. We definitely have that in a water molecule. In the other molecule, we need an unshared electron pair. If you look at the Lewis dot structure of water, you can see that the oxygen in water has electron pairs on it, so it can form a hydrogen bond with the other water molecule. As another example, here's a portion of a DNA molecule. This structure is part of one strand of the DNA, and this part is on the other strand. As you can see, each side has hydrogens attached to oxygens or nitrogens. And on the opposite side, there are atoms that have unshared electron pairs. That means we'll get several hydrogen bonds between the two DNA strands, and this is a major reason why the two strands of DNA stay attached to each other. I mentioned that ion dipole forces are stronger than dipole dipole forces. But both of these are stronger than the last kind of intermolecular force, which is called London dispersion. To understand London dispersion, imagine two helium atoms. Both of them have two protons and two electrons, so they're neutral overall. It seems like they shouldn't attract each other at all, and it's true that the attraction between them is very minute, but it isn't zero. Here's why. From our discussions in General Chem 1, you might remember that the electrons in an atom are always in motion. As a result, sometimes both of the electrons in helium are closer to one side of the atom than the other. And when that happens, the atom will be more negatively charged on one side. That makes the atom a dipole, so it can attract other atoms nearby. The attraction that results is called London dispersion, and it can happen in any atom or molecule. So London dispersion is an attraction that all molecules can feel for each other. This is a much weaker attraction than ordinary dipole-dipole forces because it only lasts for a split second. The electrons move so quickly that the lopsided charge is very temporary. London dispersion isn't named after the city London, but after the person who discovered it in 1930, Fritz London. Fritz London was a German physicist, and because of the rise of the Nazis, he emigrated from Germany in 1939 and came to the U.S., where he became a professor at Duke University. That makes him one of many refugees who made groundbreaking contributions to science in the United States. Anyway, even though London dispersion is a weak force, it's still very important for thousands of different substances. Remember, the other intermolecular forces are ion dipole, and dipole-dipole forces. But nonpolar molecules can never experience those. So London dispersion is the only attraction that nonpolar atoms and molecules can feel for each other. And that's why liquid nitrogen can exist. Nitrogen molecules can never experience dipole-dipole or ion-dipole forces, but they do feel London dispersion attracting them to each other. That allows them to stick together and form a liquid. And that's also why nitrogen has to get so cold before it becomes a liquid. The molecules have to slow down so that they stay close to each other long enough to feel the London dispersion. That's usually true. In order to become a liquid or a solid, nonpolar substances usually need to get much colder than dipoles of the same size. For example, water is a very polar molecule and it has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius, so that's the temperature at which it becomes a liquid. On the other hand, acetylene has a boiling point of negative 84 degrees Celsius. The reason it's so much lower for acetylene is that acetylene is a nonpolar molecule, so the only intermolecular force it can feel is London dispersion. So, here's a summary of what we know about intermolecular forces so far 
This will be useful to remember as we talk more about them in the next video. The strongest intermolecular force is the ion-dipole force, which occurs between any ion and any polar molecule. The next strongest force is the hydrogen bond, which occurs between any molecule that contains a hydrogen atom bonded to a nitrogen or an oxygen, and a second molecule that has an unshared electron pair. And hydrogen bonds are really an especially strong type of dipole-dipole force, which can occur between any two polar molecules. And finally, the weakest of the intermolecular forces is London dispersion. This can happen between any two molecules, whether they're polar or not. Well, that's all for now. When we talk again, we'll look at some interesting applications of intermolecular forces, including some that might surprise you. Intermolecular forces are important for everything, from glues and adhesive, to high-speed rail, to art conservation. So I hope you'll join me for the next video to find out more. I'll see you in class soon.